So you've just been there watching what's going on here in Central Florida. Of course, you can see our location on there. Um, newly issued tropical storm warnings. And of course, you heard the information from Leslie Chapman talking about hurricanestrong.org. I love that website um, also because they provide a lot of Spanish information. So if you know any friends or you have family members that speak Spanish, you can also go on that website and you'll find a lot of resources useful um, in terms of preparation for hurricanes uh, on that website. So let's dive a little bit more deeper on what's going on here with Hurricane Ian. Of course, it's closing in on Cuba um, and it's expected to make landfall here anytime in the overnight hours. And of course, what will be interesting is as it moves over there, as it as it moves over Cuba, makes landfall and moves over the Gulf of Mexico as it restrengthens um, the exact path of where it could possibly make landfall. So uh, let's go to our meteorologist, Matthew Capucci. Now, I have been very um, I'm very happy he's joining us here in Orlando but he's actually going to be out in the field. And, you know, we've been talking about like uh, where he might potentially go um, in order to uh, just look over all the situation here that's going on in Florida. So Matt, tell us a little bit about what your thinking is for this storm. Yeah, most definitely. Erica, I got to say, it's been wonderful joining you and Mike and team down here as well. It's always fun coming down to Orlando. Great people, great atmosphere. I love the nice decorations outside the studio. I mean, everything here is just bright and nice. And I love it down here. Unfortunately, the weather wise, it's going to be a quite challenging to go through the next 48 to 72 hours, including especially near the Tampa area. The reason being we got this big swirl. That is the potential landfall of this cyclone as depicted by the European model. What we're seeing really is one annulus, one ring of intense winds. Of course, it's gusty outside that, but the eye wall is where the bulk of the winds are. However, the worst storm surge will expand well beyond the eye wall and can cover a much bigger area. By the way, take a look at offshore waves. Anything like this in the purple magenta color, that's 45 to 50 plus feet. This model is suggesting waves to about 60 or 70 feet over the open Gulf of Mexico. And in addition to the surge, some of these high end waves might approach the coastline. So don't be surprised if just offshore of the beaches, you see waves 20, 30 plus feet. So let's take a look though and kind of forecast exactly what will go on with this storm and talk a little bit about the structure of a tropical cyclone. Of course, here's composite reflectivity. This is kind of what we're used to saying is we're used to seeing this is sort of depicting what the radar might look like per this model. So we'll time it out. This is late Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning. So across southeast Florida, you can see these sort of kidney bean shaped bands of rain, heavier, element, heavier elements, heavier cells, uh, indicating potential for some rotation within these. So even before the storm even approaches, we got that chance of a couple tornadoes in the rain bands there. Then that heavy rain really starts to overspread southern parts of the Sunshine State as the eye wall starts approaching. So here are the outer rain bands, some of the inner rain bands here too. So again, tornado risk throughout the day on Wednesday, even beginning early. You might get some overnight tornadoes as far north as, say, Tampa in the direction of Orlando. So even here in Orlando, where my radar is located, we cannot rule out the chance of a couple rotating storms. Then you know, we start take, talking about where this thing might make landfall. Again, this could be shifted up 50 miles, shifted south 50 miles. We're not sure yet. In the southeastern part of the state, more tornado chances. On the east side or the right side, the southerly side, you get onshore winds. That will bring the greatest storm surge. For, for example, the Caloosahatchee River down towards you know, Fort Myers Bay, Naples area, or if it winds up being farther north in Tampa. Off the north, offshore winds, which is slightly better for storm surge. But here's the thing. We don't know if this will pass a little farther north or a little farther south of Tampa. So we don't know if they're on the windy side, the onshore winds, or the offshore wind side of the storm. So ultimately, impacts will be very serious. Within the eye, you'll get calm winds. A little tiny pocket of winds just going flat calm for a little while. You might even see the sun poke out. In a storm like this, probably not. Dry air might actually wrap around like this. So I think we're actually going to see the heaviest rain north of the system. For example, like you know, Bradenton area in the direction of like Jacksonville. Somebody over here will see about 20 inches of rain potentially when all is said and done. And of course, things kind of start to, you know, I don't want to say fade inland, but they lose their organization farther south. So this might be what we call a half a cane. What I mean by that is eventually as dry air enters the system, wrapping around from the west into the south, that squeezes out the heavier rainfall farther north, right along a boundary of moisture, which is kind of interesting to see. And of course, this can actually propagate all the way up the eastern seaboard with at least some rain and potential tornado activity as we head towards the Saturday and Sunday time frame for the Carolinas, maybe the Virginia Tidewater in the direction of the Rappahannock region. So ultimately, Erica, you know, a lot of impacts with this system. As for where I'm targeting, you know, I, I ordinarily want to be on the windy side of the system, which is the southern side, or whatever the, the right side is when it makes landfall. In this case, the fact that we'll have heavier rainfall farther to the north 
might actually drag down higher winds. I've seen that on a couple of the models. So we might actually have a, an unusual situation where the strongest winds are actually those on the north side of the circulation. But really, anyone in the eye wall, plan for gusts 90, 100, 110 miles an hour potentially, lesser winds outside that. When you get into the eye wall, it's very abrupt. It is like this. Inside the eye, virtually calm conditions. Off to the north, we'll see serious flooding. So I might personally target, honestly, right in downtown Tampa. Erica? Yeah, so let's actually look, because um, I want to show this graphic here. Uh, it kind of highlights exactly the type of winds or potential wind gusts that you may get over this area. So uh, let's show that uh, here, uh, Jack. Jack and Matt Highland back there helping us out this evening and, you know, um, you know, keeping us here, uh, uh, giving you the latest update. So let's go to this graphic and show you what's going on. So those colors you're seeing on your screen, the pink colors, um, that does include areas of Tampa, St. Petersburg, all the way down uh, along the west coast of Florida. You may see potential for winds greater than 110 miles per hour. That's what our meteorologist Matthew Cucci was just saying. Just a little bit inland of that, that red shaded area between 74 to 110 miles per hour. Um, that's about category one hurricane uh, strength winds and then potential for winds 58 to 73 miles per hour. That's those areas that are under tropical storm warnings. I'm talking about us here in Orlando, stretching all the way into portions of possibly Gainesville, Florida, and all the way down into uh, Florida's west coast here. And this is where you have the potential of seeing 58 to 73 mile per hour wind gusts. And then on the Florida east side, so I'm talking about you guys in Jacksonville, possibly just to the south of Savannah, Georgia, Valdosta, Georgia, all of you guys in that yellow shaded area, 39 to 57 mile per hour wind gusts. So wind will arrive pretty much for the entire state. The entire state is almost all highlighted under this wind threat. And I also want to show you the potential rainfall heading here over the next several days. Now, this is also highlighting a region. You can see those bright yellows and reds. Um, essentially, these bright yellows means a lot of rainfall. And this is where I'm concerned for those flooding risks, especially if the storm system does slow down along the coastline. This has a potential of greater um, flooding risks over these regions. So Tampa, uh, you're not obviously you're under this threat with the storm surge threat, but Jacksonville, you're also not out of it. Um, and especially inland, as you can see, something I'm concerned about, and especially with how these rainfall maps are trending, looks like we may see a lot of rainfall coming into portions of Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, especially across those coastal regions. So that's something also that we're going to be fine tuning here over the next several days as we get closer to uh, Hurricane Ian's landfall uh, in the United States here along Florida is West Coast. So a lot of impacts coming together here with wind impacts, flooding, storm surge, things that you all need to be thinking about. I know you Floridians are resilient, but if you're new to the state, just prepare in advance. If you didn't this weekend, really, I think um, if you live across the central Florida area and even Florida's east coast, tomorrow will be potentially the last day to get ready for this. A lot of schools are closing. I did see earlier a tweet uh, that Tampa International Airport has officially closed as well. They're closing, uh, I think, starting tomorrow. And a lot of schools locally, too, even here in central Florida, are starting to close their doors. So a lot of preparations are already starting to get a going over these regions. Of course, evacuation orders across Pinellas and even uh, Hillsborough County there in Tampa, Florida. So a lot to digest. I know a lot of you guys that are joining us this evening um, from Florida asking us a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, so continue to do that. Um, you know, we're going to be going over uh, what's going on here. And we're going to stay on with you for about another 10 minutes here. Um, before we wrap this stream up, but Matt, is there anything else that you want to highlight? Um, you know, something that we may potentially be tracking over the next several days, especially for those of you that live in Florida. Yeah, honestly, I, I don't want to underestimate the rainfall threat. You know, we, we can start off talking about surge. We know that surge will be an issue along the coastline as water is pushed against the coast. But here's the thing. Water inland that falls as rain will want to drain as well. Weather models indicating potential for, say, up to about 20 inches of rain, especially just left or north of the center. 10 to 20 inches, anyone in the purple. I do like this model the best. Yeah, we'll see some decent rain to the south, but ultimately someone near and especially north of the eye will wind up seeing about 10 to 20 inches worth of rain when all is said and done. So this is all going to try to drain out into the bay, into the rivers, the tributaries, all that. And it likely won't be able to as efficiently as it otherwise could because the rivers will be backed up by onshore flow, pushing seawater against the coastline, which will be a big issue there. So there's the European model. Again, jackpot of rain right over the Tampa area. If we take a look at the American GFS model, well, that heaviest axis of moisture stays a little bit farther west offshore. Personally, I'm not quite buying that. And here's actually the new GFS model. Let's go back to one scan previously, and we'll see, yeah, I mean, some places seeing a decent amount of rain. You can actually see some heavy rain over by Jacksonville as well. So a lot of folks seeing 
6 to 12 inches, which is a, a lot of rain. We'll see widespread flash flooding, but also more in a few locales. Canadian model shows that jackpot just offshore. The new model is not in yet, though. I suspect that'll likely be pushed a little farther east. The German Icon model, wow, this is actually the, the new German Icon model, which is kind of the fastest one at this time of day, and it shows the same exact thing, 20 inches of rain for the purple stripe. If we take a look at uh, surface pressure, just kind of see where the, the German model suggests the storm might go. Yeah, the, the new German model, same thing, between the Caloosahatchee River and Tampa Bay. So some models even trending farther south of Tampa, we just don't know yet. Ultimately, I do think Tampa will sort of be like ground zero for where this disaster may occur. Uh, that said, really anyone on the western coast of Florida, big impacts possible. Lesser risk over the Big Bend. Initially, we were saying the Big Bend, but look, we changed our forecasts because we kind of get refined data. Better chance farther south, so really west Florida. You got to make sure that even if you don't live near the coastline, you can still uh, suffer damages and, uh, of course, hazards like that from inland freshwater flooding, isolated tornadoes too. I think the biggest uh, takeaway, Erica, is for folks to know what hazard will impact them, what they are vulnerable to. Yeah, Matt. And, you know, this is something that we were talking about earlier in the evening um, before this live. Something that I noticed, uh, especially over the past, I think, two hurricane seasons is as these storms approach the coastline, um, they tend to rapidly intensify. Now, I, this forecast right now calls for a major hurricane right before landfall. And then as it makes landfall, a category two storm. But do you think there's any risk of this happening? Um, I know there's a lot of meteorological factors that may actually inhibit this. Uh, inhibit this. Um, but what do you think about that? Do you think there's chances of this rapidly intensifying right before it makes landfall? So I think it may surprise us and maintain its strength as it nears the coastline. I don't foresee any rapid intensification for two reasons. Number one, we'll take a look at the upper air wind. And you'll notice that by the time we start seeing the hurricane approach, it can kind of feel these winds over, say, southern Georgia approaching the Gulf Coast. So as this moves a little farther north, it'll start being disrupted by those winds up there. So it'll be trying to weaken even if it doesn't quite do it before landfall, if we take a look at that upper level shear or the pernicious change of wind speed and or direction with height. Yeah, look, all north, north of the system, we got a lot of shear up there. So it will be kind of trying to weaken as it approaches landfall. It may not fully do it. The other thing too, upper air moisture. Take a look, this thing's wrapping in dry air from behind it, which is going to make much of the moisture fall on the north side of the system. But ultimately, I think these two limiting factors will prevent it from undergoing any rapid intensification that said, I do expect it to sort of maintain its strength as it approaches the coastline, but ultimately, you know, it, it will sort of be in the downtrend. That said, still a very serious storm, America. Yeah. Uh, Erica, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It appears your microphone is having some issues, so I'm going to actually take it back for a little bit while we get that uh, tech issue straightened out. I want to go back and uh, discuss the surge a little bit more. Anyone in the red, worst surge, 5 to 10 feet. And keep in mind, this is a 90th percentile forecast. What that means, there's a 1 in 10 chance it gets this bad or worse. So we call this a reasonable worst case scenario forecast. For rainfall, we try to kind of, kind of give you like straight up amounts. But as for storm surge, because there are so many variables at play and so many kind of irregularities at the coastline, weird topography, stuff like that. We can't really predict it super well in advance. We kind of broad brush it and say, here's your worst case scenario, what you should plan for just in case. And that includes five to 10 feet of inundation somewhere around Tampa Bay, five to eight feet north of town towards Homosassa Springs, south of town towards the Caloosahatchee River, Naples area as well. And eventually as we head towards Southern Florida and the Keys and down towards the Florida Straits and Troy Tortugas area, about three or four feet of inundation. Keep in mind that you get to Key West only about to three or four feet above sea level overall. But ultimately, yeah, you, you got to watch out for a variety of different hazards, of course. Surge is one of them. Wind is another one. And uh, here you see, of course, the uh, dry air kind of wrapping in on that circulation. I want to briefly see if we can get the latest American GFS model, which is just coming in right now. And, you know, it, this is as far out as the, the model can go. I will say that it looks very similar to the previous run, similar in intensity, similar in, in you know, strength, position, maybe even a little farther east. So the, the trend is, is not our friend, Erica. I, I, I got to say, things are not looking great for Tampa. Uh, very good. 
Hey, guess what? I'm back. I'm so sorry. We have an, another tech issue once again. I, I think ultimately, I, Eric, I'm going to peer over your shoulder. If you want to pull up two or three questions, we'll answer quick. And then I think we should kind of sign things off for tonight so we can sort of stock up our energy for tomorrow. We got some comments from folks saying, Zach, for example, if it heads further south around Sarasota, Port Charlotte, how much would you expect the surge to increase around Fort Myers, Bonita Springs area, uh, down towards Bradenton? A, a great question. You know, we'll go back to the surge map, Zach, and I, I think the key takeaway is this. Near and to the right of the hurricane will be the worst surge. If this pushes a little farther south, could it get worse here? Absolutely. The one, I don't want to say saving grace, but the one benefit of a, a farther south track, other than water being scooped out of Tampa Bay rather than into it in this hypothetical scenario, will be the fact that you don't have as big of an inlet. When you have an inlet like this, you're just pushing water right into it, which is just kind of the worst thing. At least here, I mean, yeah, you're still going to see some significant surge. The only kind of piece of good news in this stretch of coastline, there aren't really big inlets. So great question there. We'll actually stroll back over here and see if we can pull up another question real quick. Uh, Bill was saying, actually, let's go down to us. Who are we going to pick? Uh, yes, if you live in Tampa, you should evacuate. Uh, what we want to say is, is uh, for folks to follow local officials, they know best. How is the situation in Naples, asks Matthias. Uh, yeah, you know, Naples is kind of, i say the risk is increasing right now. We're seeing more of a southerly trend of the models. The National Hurricane Center's cone is shifting farther south and farther east. That would put Naples on the dangerous side of the storm. Of course, all the sides are dangerous for different reasons. Left, you get more flooding from rain. Right, you get more surge. So really, you know, six and one half doesn't another. But I will say the risk is increasing in places like Naples, Fort Myers, and the Caloosahatchee River. And we'll take, say, one more question. Who should we get the last question for tonight? Uh, let's see. Uh, Paul says, uh, stay safe for everyone. Don't forget your pets. Yeah, you want to make sure you have medications for yourself, your pets, food for everyone, water for everyone. Uh, make sure you have everything you need to for the... Uh, say that again, Damien. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Matt. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll walk back a little bit more. Uh, so let's, uh, one of the last uh, questions. Then right after Hurricane Delta hit us, yeah, power outages. So we could see decent power outages uh, with this storm, which is a, a problem, too. You know, Florida has decent infrastructure. Uh, we, we've seen some areas that have been sort of socked time and time again. At least in Florida, a lot of cables are buried. Uh, that said, uh, you know, we, we uh, still can plan for uh, an extended period of power outages where this does make landfall an impact. So plan for a couple days without power. Get the food, get the water, charge up the devices, the tablets. A reminder, by the way, even if you lose TV and internet in your house, if you keep cell service, you can keep watching us on my radar. We'll be streaming kind of around the clock during the height of the actual storm itself. I'll be in the field. Aaron Jajak will be in the field. Erica will be holding down the fort here in Orlando. we got the full team watching this around the clock. And, of course, we'll have more streams tomorrow with meteorologist Mike Linden and, of course, Erica Lopez. I will be in the field. We got you covered, and that is a promise. With that, I think we'll sign off for tonight. We thank you so much for sticking around with us, giving us your time, sharing these great questions. On behalf of myself and the one, the only, the Erica Lopez, uh, we thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.